One, two, three. What is the Great American Loop? Glad you asked. Hi, we're the Boomer Shines, and we just finished the Great American Loop with ourselves, our two kiddos, and our two cats. So let's tell you all about it. Do you know how many times we've been asked what's the loop? Uh, a lot. A lot. Most people have never heard of the loop before, so we're here to tell you all about it. Now, what is the loop? The Great American Loop is a circumnavigation of the eastern seaboard of the United States and Canada mm -hmm. that only has a small amount of open ocean. Yeah, you're using the intercoastal waterway, rivers, lakes, canals. And the best way to describe it, the way we describe it, is high adventure, low risk. Yes, for the most part, you're always in sight of land when you do it. You spring up the East Coast, so you do that in the springtime. Um, you spend your summers up in the Great Lakes in Canada, and then you basically fall down the river system in the fall, and then winter in Florida, and we added on the Bahamas, which was pretty fantastic. But we started in the Palm Beach area, went up the intercoastal all spring, took a left in New York City, summer in Canada, Great Lakes, down Lake Michigan to the Chicago area by late September. Mm -hmm. And then October, November, December, we were navigating the rivers on our way down to Mobile Bay. And then, as I said, winter in Florida. It's pretty fabulous. Let's winter. talk boats. What kind of vessel do you do? Well, here's the cool part about the loop. A lot of people think you've got to be loaded to do it. You can do it on any boat of any size. So people have kayaked the There's loop. There's a guy in a kayak right now with a cat. They people have, have jet skied. Jet skied, pontoon boats. We we took the opposite, the other <laughs> extreme and we had a four bedroom, four bath or four stateroom, four head. We did um, a boat. subset of the loop called the bouge loop. Yes. So the beauty of the loop is that anybody with a dream and a passion can figure out how to do it if they want to. Um, the de there's a, such a huge variety of budgets and boats. You can be as small as you want, but how big can you be, Mark? The rule of thumb measurements are you can be really up to about 70 feet. You don't want to be any more than that. We were 56 and, and that, that was, was pushing, pushing it. it. I wouldn't, mm, yeah. You can be, um, most boats are going to be about 15 foot in beam. That is called the width of the boat. We were 18. We were pushing it again. Another but measurement. See, I think you can go up to 23 feet in beam. The Port Severn Lock. Okay. It is the lock, it, and we filled that entire lock, and we that was tricky. Lock. Uh, no, we didn't really. We had a couple feet on each side, but it was it was a tricky lock because yeah. it was windy and anyway. Okay, you're gonna hear another stat: air height. That is how tall your boat is above, above the, the water. water. That's not including the water, the boat under the water. That is a rule of thumb of 19 feet six inches. We were over that, and we made it under what's called the Sanitation Bridge in Chicago. Oh, good golly, Molly. I mean, we're going under by... We're doing it. Holy... Holy... I'm shaking! Don't do anything, Dad. Just keep going. Keep going, Dad. Keep going. Holy... <laughs> we made it! Dad, you're a rock star. We did it. That is a fixed bridge. It doesn't move. So if you can't get under that, you have to do the great U-turn. We were over 20 feet and we made it. Well, well we, we, we were over 19 foot six. six and we made it. That doesn't mean you will make it, but on that particular day, our boat made it. So shoot for shoot for 19 and a half and you'll you'll be fine yeah. and it'll be much less stressful. And then the other one that people kind of downplay, they kind of just kind of glance over it, but it became very important in Canada where the bottom of the water, the seabed is granite. It's very unforgiving and that is the draft. That is how deep your boat is. So, you're going to hear people say, "Eh, 4 4 feet, 4 and a half feet." Well, you can do technically you can do up to 6. Yeah, don't do that. Don't go over 5 if you want to do the loop and enjoy the loop and not be stressed out about hitting everything in Canada. And anecdotal evidence based on our loop. This I have no, there's there's no actual science. So this, this is just observation. All of our friends in boats that drew more than 4 and a half feet all went through multiple props. 
Yes. So um, they Two did the Two of them loop. were the exact same kind of boat. We're not going to mention what kind of boat, but a deep V hull um, with very exposed propellers and a fast boat. So and they were going fast too. But one one boat went through seven props just on the river system. So I'm not going to name it. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you they are. They laugh about it. We love you. We, we thought we might make little little propeller stickers and like stick them on the like back. Like bombers from World War II propellers. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, those are the constricting well, so data. We were four and a half feet. We did the whole loop. We never needed to In Canada. change our propellers. So I think from four and a half feet to five feet, you just need to budget time and money knowing you probably will have to do some prop repair. Mm -hmm. um, you, it could just be dumb luck that that's what happened. But I'm just saying you're, it's an easier ride. The, the it's an easier time yes. the shallower your boat is. Hey, how many people do the loop? Have you said that? No. So interesting fact, um, on average, about 150 boats complete the loop every year. More people summit Mount Everest than do the, loop. the Great American Loop. Now, there are barriers to entry. You have to get the boat. You have to do all that. You know, you can put on hiking boots and carabiners and some gear. There is a lot of, have you climbers. tried, to, have you looked into summiting Everest? There's a lot of barriers to entry to summiting Everest. Permits and <laughs> Permits, it's about a hundred grand. Anyway, physical strength and endurance and a little bit of crazy if you're doing Everest. Props to everyone who does. Yeah, but yeah, not on my to-do list. We get a question: Can I rent a boat and do the Great Loop? As of right now, no. And insurance companies don't like insuring things when you're going country to country, USA to Canada and or the Bahamas, and they don't really don't like doing that. And you're navigating every type of waterway. When people say, "What kind of waters were you on?" You say, "All of them." Everything. <laughs> And you Rivers, learn. lakes, oceans, tides, currents. It's like you have to know how to do well, you, everything. And, and or you, you learn, learn. On your, as you go. So, because that next question, how much experience do you need? That's a great question. You need to be safe in whatever you feel makes you safe. We had experience on intercoastal. We had a lot of intercoastal experience. On a 42-foot boat. And we have a lot of lake experience. We had never boated in a big boat on rivers, but you figure it out. So um, you there, just have to use your noggin. There are people who have left on the loop who had probably to be told that the pointy end of the boat was the bow and the flat end was the stern. Like, they're probably... And then there's And people, they did it. And then there's people who spend, you know, a year just training to do the loop. We knew people who drove the loop route so they had seen all the marinas. Figure out what, what, what you're comfortable with. We didn't have, you know, all that extra time, so we... Yeah had experience, we did what we were comfortable with, and away you go. And the loop has always been there. Obviously, all these water systems go back some to the 1800s. People were doing, there's a woman that did the loop, what we would call the loop today in the 1950s. It was herself on a 22-foot boat with two outboard motors, and she did the loop. They didn't call it the loop back then. Yeah. Then they didn't call it the loop until, really, the Staubs, with, her, with their book, Honey, I Bought a Boat, who kind of it's formed the Great Loop Cruisers Association, then it became what it's known as today. And years ago when you did the loop, you did not have cellular connection like you have now. You, your communication was difficult. You had to provision a bunch more. You had to go to a grocery store and get weeks and weeks of food. Now, when we did the loop, we were always in cell coverage. For the most part, not really always. But Just about every marina, they have a loaner car, or with Uber now, you can get Uber, a ride Instacart. to. So you're stocking up for like a week. So it's gotten a lot, lot easier. Yeah, it's super. It's very easy and convenient. How long does it take most people to do the loop, Mark? I'm glad you asked, Linda. Most people, it'll take about a year, nine months to a year. Once again, make it your loop. Some people do it in sections, and they're like, I want to do the loop in. 45 days. Awesome. You're going to miss a lot of great stuff and you're going to burn a lot of fuel, but if that's what you want to do, do it. Yeah, people have done it very Some fast. Some people will go fast and put the boat up and then put the boat back in, a smaller boat, and keep going. Some people will go yeah. slow and do a section and come back to it a year later and it'll take them three years to do the loop. Yeah, so they'll do like the Great Lakes one summer and then they'll go back home for a year and then they'll do the next section. You but know. the traditional is unplugged for a year ish do the loop and then come back yes and who who are who are the typical loopers not us <laughs> <laughs> i'll just about to say that we are not typical loopers and we did it with kids there were four other kid boats doing the loop the year we did it last year Is yeah right? we i don't know we kind of calculated no calculation we guessed that in the history of the loop since it's been the loop maybe 50 kids have done the entire loop mm -hmm. so not a lot of kids out there mostly retired yep um folks 
it's a great if you're retired but still young and active in your go-go years it's a great thing to do um, as a older as older parents with kids uh, it was amazing we waited personally till our kids were old enough to be safe if they fell overboard and um, helpful and remember it small enough or young enough where they still like you because if you go with a teenager that well changes. I mean I guess that just depends on your relationship with your kid. teenager but it worked. but generally teenagers are probably not as open to spending as much time mm -hmm. uh, with family and then you know what are they going to remember you go too young they're not going to remember it so we tried to I think we hit it pretty right with 9 at 11 to where they liked us they were safe in the water they and, fun and they, were helpful. they can remember it yeah, how many miles did we go? How many miles is the loop? The loop is around 6,000 miles. We did a few side trips to Chattanooga. We did a side trip to Chattanooga. That was a 500 mile round trip. Uh, and then we did Bahamas. And that, we were total just shy of 7,000 miles. I think we missed it by 100 miles. We were like 68, 6,900 miles. And you can start the loop anywhere on the route. And here's an interesting question. Do you go clockwise or counterclockwise and why? You go counterclockwise because you're falling down the rivers with the current. So you're going with the current from basically Chicago down to Mobile. You can do the opposite, but you're going against the river current. So it's just trickier, you're burning more fuel. You're burning more fuel and a lot of boats that do the loop are a trawler, which is a slow boat. And if you have a trawler whose max speed is seven, eight knots, and you have a three, four knot current, you are barely making headway for a very long time, 1,300 miles of rivers. <laughs> and fuel range just depends on your boat and which direction you're going, but there are fuel stops, with the exception of the rivers where you have to pay attention. Everywhere else there's tons of fuel. You need to be able to go about 300 miles range, uh, and that is a limiting factor for a lot of boats. Can you do a gas or diesel? Yes, you can do both, but a diesel is just more robust. There's more diesel available along the way, and gas engines are just a little bit more finicky. But sure, do a gas, do a gas outboard, inboard, whatever. You do you. And so, how much is it going to take? A lot. How much or how little do you want to spend? Yes. So we, yeah. If if you're if you, you go can't fast, us, ask us what does the loop cost because our loop was our loop. We ate out a lot. We stayed at a lot of marinas and we had a bigger boat. So that's a totally different experience and we bought about 10,000 stuffed animals for the kids along the way. So we <laughs> can't tell they you bought them from their self, what your their budget is going to be. But yeah, yes. You may be on a sailboat that you've dismasted and you have a 25 horsepower motor and you want to anchor out most of the time and eat sandwiches and not ever go to marina. And You're going to you, spend a lot less than a lot we did. Less. But it, that, again, you do you and that's that is the beauty of the loop, is you can do it on all budgets, all different size boats, all different kinds of boats. You just have to have the passion. So that. I got what, one. What? Can I swim on the loop? Yes, you can, but it's going to be very few places on the loop. We did the Bahamas, and that was a ton of water. We swam from. in Canada. We swam in Canada in the summer. It was amazing. The rest of the time, it's either cold, too much dirty. current, dirty, or just flat out dangerous to swim because you don't want to swim in the marina. So if you are looking for a, a boat adventure where you're going to be hanging out off the boat and swimming a lot, you know, go to the Bahamas. The loop is not a bikini uh, and bathing suit adventure. But it's so awesome and you do, you learn. What I loved about it goes back to the high adventure, low risk. You learn a ton about boating in all different waterways you would not learn otherwise and it's got for kids it's incredible because you have all the history of the eastern seabird especially that you're learning as you are boating through it so yep. i thought it was especially cool to do it with kids it's harder obviously with kids it is it's a special breed of us that it wants to the loop in itself can be hard and then adding teaching kids is tricky but totally doable and i think totally worth it and if you've never owned a boat and you're, how do, you, how do I get my loop boat? We did a YouTube video. We have a video on how to purchase a boat. We also have one on insurance. So we got yes. a lot of good references for you. There's tons of other references out there, but our particular story we have on there, we chronicled it. We learned a lot. Yep, and there's the American Great Loop Cruisers Association, the AGLCA, and their website. Join it. Yeah, their website has a ton of information. So this is just a quick intro to what is, is the Great American Loop. And that's it. 
Anyway, if you wouldn't mind picking up two pieces of trash every day, that would be awesome because, um, yeah, there's a lot of litter out there. And if you're enjoying our waterways, let's keep them clean. Keep it from washing into our waterways. And that's about all I have. Do one more thing. What? Shine on.